All right, well, good morning, Galilee. If you have your Bibles, grab them and open them to John chapter 2. That's where we're going to be this morning, John chapter 2. Now, this story is probably one of the more well-known stories in Scripture. Uh, Most of you, uh, whether you've spent a whole lot of time reading through Scripture or not, you're familiar with the story of Jesus turning water into wine. It takes place at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Very well-known story. It's actually the first miracle that Jesus ever performed, despite what you may hear from other sources. Um, I know there are stories or rumors in extra-biblical writings about Jesus and, and turning little clay pigeons into real birds as a child and doing things. But, but God in his word tells us this is the first miracle That he's done. He hasn't done one leading up to this. This is it. And all this reading this week about weddings, it just caused me to reflect on my wedding when Rachel and I got married. And so just last month, we celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. And I think back on our wedding, and and I guess I try and think of all the memories and I think of what how the day went and just what took place 20 years ago when we first got married. And probably the one memory that just keeps jumping out to me the most is the fact that I was late for my own wedding. Um, Late enough to where people were starting to really get concerned. (laughs) I was so late getting there. Now, I I seem to have been branded kind of the the scatterbrained, back and forth kind of guy, but but I'm very, I'm, I'm a stickler for times. Uh, it's rare that I'm late for anything. It's, my goal is to be here at 7 a.m., even if I have nothing to do up here on a Sunday morning for church, an hour and 15 minutes early, sometimes earlier than that. I like to be everywhere early. I don't like to be late, so I'm not someone who's just late all the time. But the reason I was late for my own wedding is, uh, well, at the time I drove a little single-cab, four-wheel drive Nissan pickup truck. Not very big. I mean, if you know what I'm talking about, those little vehicles... You put two people and you get one little bag and that truck's full. And uh, my wife drove a little Saturn that was not in the greatest of shape. And we were going on our honeymoon to the Smoky Mountains for a week. And everybody kept telling us, you can't take either one of those vehicles to the Smoky Mountains. I mean, you're getting married January the 3rd. You're going to be there on January the 4th. It's probably going to be snow and ice up there. You need a different vehicle. So... Rachel just so happened to have been working, babysitting as she was going through college for a lady whose husband worked at a dealership. And he said, I got you. I got you covered. I work for the dealership. And he like ran a dealership in Hammond. And he said, I'm going to get you a good four-wheel drive. Uh, You need four-wheel drive for the snow and ice that could be up there. And uh, so you need something four-wheel drive. You need something bigger, something to cab. So I'm going to get you like something that would be neat, you know, an SUV. And so... We're sitting here expecting this really cool Z71 four-wheel drive Tahoe to go to our honeymoon. We both got two old raggedy vehicles, and we're thinking, this is going to be nice. Well, I had to meet him at a, I had to meet him somewhere to get this vehicle from him before the wedding. So I had someone drop me off at a Winn-Dixie in Walker waiting to meet this guy to get this vehicle, and he was running late. And so I was held up. I didn't have a ride. I didn't have a vehicle. I was just sitting there on my wedding day in the parking lot of Winn-Dixie thinking, I really hope this guy gets here soon with this rental vehicle because I, I, I have to get married. Like, I got to get to Central, the little church on Sullivan Road. And uh, finally, he comes pulling up. And to my disappointment, not only was he late, which caused me to be late for my wedding, he did not have a really cool Z71 Tahoe. My wife and I got to go on our honeymoon in a nice Toyota minivan. Because <laughs> that's what every 20-year-old young married couple wants to take on a honeymoon is a mom wagon. But it's a memory. It's a memory, you know. We laugh about it now. Um, but this wedding here in John 2 has many, many more, uh, a far greater reason to stand out as such, a, such an incredible memory in the lives of these people. John chapter 2, let's start by reading the first three verses. John 2, he says in verse 1, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now, weddings were a really big deal in the Jewish community. They still are today. And and weddings are a big deal to us. Uh, But usually when we think of weddings now, some people have had people get married recently. It's expensive. Amen. I knew I'd get an amen. It is expensive. And, and, and in some ways, it's, it's astounding how much money some people spend on weddings. It's a lot. But back then, it was a little different than how it is now. Now, when we think of how big of a deal weddings are, we think of how many people do you invite and how much money does it cost. But then, it, it was more of, of, uh, the, of the length of celebration in the activities that would go into it. In other words, their wedding didn't just last on a Saturday evening for two, three, four hours, something like that. It was a week-long celebration, oftentimes lasting an entire week, where they would celebrate the couple. They would actually dress the couple up in super fine clothes. Uh, oftentimes, you can read about how they would put a crown, crowns on them to, to treat them as if they were king and queen, like royalty, because it was their special day. They're supposed to be treated in, in high regard, and they would march them all around town so everyone could come out and celebrate with them. And it was to such a degree that, that even, uh, there, there's some interesting book that I've used for years uh, called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. It's a big, big volume, but if you like historical, cultural context, that is the go-to place. Uh, But he writes even of Jezebel, that evil, wicked Jezebel in Scripture, and how even Jezebel, despite her wickedness, was known to always go out. And when she died, even though she was so wicked, they let dogs, wild dogs, consume her body. It's kind of weird, but they removed her hands and her feet in honor of her because even that wicked woman did not miss a wedding. She would be walking to that wedding and clapping cheering the couple on the whole time. That's how big of a deal these weddings were to the Jewish community. But not only was the actual wedding ceremony and celebration important, wine was incredibly important. It was a crucial part of a wedding ceremony is to have wine there. There's, you can read about families that would spend most of their lives saving up and storing up wine so that they would have plenty of wine for when their child got married to have the wine there. And actually, it was opposite of the way it is today. Some of you would say, please change it back. It was the groom's parents that paid for all this, not the bride's parents. The groom is the one who was, who was uh, supposed to have all of this he needed to provide for this ceremony and have all of this wine that they have saved up over years and purchased and acquired so that when they have this week-long celebration, they have plenty of it out there. That was the groom's job. And you think of what it kind of symbolizes. It's not that wine wasn't a big deal because they just had to have something to drink for the whole week. It's more that it symbolized joy and prosperity and good times. It was more for what wine stood for that you needed to have it there than actually having something to drink. And you think in these simple terms, if, if a groom and his family, if this groom can even supply adequate wine for this wedding? How can I be sure that you can adequately care and protect and take care of my bride, of my daughter? You can't. And so it was a huge deal, a huge ordeal. My wife and I tend to be a little bit on opposite ends of this. I can say, I can speak a little more freely now because she's not at this service. Um, But uh, I I tend to overshoot everything and she tends to undershoot everything. So we like to say, let's both throw an idea out there and just pick something in between. And that's what we'll go with because we're probably both off a little bit. But when it comes time for uh, food, meals, whatever it may be, uh, getting stuff, acquiring things, I, I, I always think we need way more than what we need, and she'll undershoot it. She'll buy one pizza, and I think, one pi- there's six of us in our family. And she'll say, yeah, but it's a big pizza. Everybody can have two slices. And I said, two? 
Like, we have two teenage boys. They'll eat that whole pizza just themselves. I, if it was up to me, I'd order three pizzas. And she would say, That's, you're being a glutton. You don't need that much food. And, and so I would overshoot, she would undershoot. And we can laugh at those differences. We do that with the youth ministry all the time. I don't know how many times I've bought stuff for some kind of event, and I realize I've got tons left over. But, but I'm always afraid of running out. I would rather have extra than not have enough. I guess that's my mindset. And so it causes me to, to overshoot on everything usually. But we can laugh about that. But in biblical times, this was not a laughing matter. If you ran out of wine at a wedding, you could actually have a legal court case brought against you by the guest of the wedding. You could be sued for that. It was such an offensive thing if you could not provide enough wine for a wedding. So it was a huge ordeal. Also notice in the text that <laughs> uh, Jesus was invited to this wedding. He didn't just happen upon it, but they specifically invited Jesus to come be a part of this wedding. And notice what Mary says to him there in verse 3. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. That simple little statement, they have no wine. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I have a mom. I've been around moms. When Mary says they have no wine, I think she's implying a little more than just simply making an observation. Some of you moms saying, yes, I think she is. That's right. How many times have you heard a parent just make a comment that's, uh, that trash is overflowing? Translation, you better get in there and take that trash out and put another bag in the can. Or, man, that sink is full of dirty dishes. What does that mean, mom? That means you better get your behind in there and clean those dishes. They, they, go, do it. I, I think Mary, when she says, <clears throat> They have no wine. <laughs> I, I think what she's implying is, Jesus, you got to do something. You, you need to do something for this situation. But verse 4, look what Jesus says. It says, And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, if my mom said, Hey, that trash is full, and I just looked at woman, it's probably as far as it would go, and it would stop right there. You know, it um, would not go well. Would not go well. What's interesting, uh, this is a word that, that I've had circled in my Bible for a while because uh, it, it doesn't come across in English the way it would have in the original language. Um, this was actually a very respectful, kind term. You know what's funny is most commentators, they all describe this word the same way, and I couldn't help but kind of chuckle at this because they all will say... This is akin to that old southern expression, ma'am. And I, I read this and I think, old southern expression? Are we the only ones that really say ma'am? Does no one else say ma'am to, to a woman anymore? I didn't think that was just an old southern thing. But, but you do say ma'am. I mean, I know growing up, that was one thing my dad would say all the time. I can't tell you how many times. If dad said something, he'd say, huh? He would say, don't you hum me, boy. you say, sir. Or ma'am, don't hum me. And man, I can hear my dad still saying that, don't you hum me. And, but this was a respectful, a respectful thing for Jesus to say, woman, that term was, was very respectful. Matter of fact, if, if, if you want to turn there, you can. You, John 19, when Jesus is on the cross, when Jesus is on the cross and he's about to die, about to give his life, and he actually is, Mary is there at the cross, and he knows that someone else has got to care for her because Jesus is obviously the oldest child, so he's the one that would have been caring for his mother. But look what it says in verse 26 of John 19. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is John, the author of this gospel, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. When he is about to die, 
and he's trying to give his mom into the care of someone else who can watch over her, protect her. Most people believe that even by this point in John 2, Joseph has already passed away. He's dead. He's not around by this point. Sometime between the age of about 12 and 30, that, that, that Joseph has passed away. And so Jesus is the primary one who's caring for Mary. And so he uses that same term there on the cross as he's dying, woman. Behold your son. It's respectful. So he's looking at his mom. He's not being rude. He's not being harsh. He's just saying, it's not my time. My hour's not come. And you can even see that phrase about the hour, which is almost synonymous with saying his purpose, his, the intention of Christ here on this earth, his mission. It's, it's not there yet. It's not there. Hang on, kind of. Jesus seems to be saying, I see the problem and I'll fix it. But not however Mary, whatever Mary had in her mind, it's like Jesus, you ever, we're talking a lot about parents or spouses, you ever have a parent just say, I, I hear you, I'll take care of it. That's kind of like saying, I, I'm not going to do exactly what you're telling me, but I got it, don't worry. I'll take care of it. Jesus saying, what does this have to do with me? My hour's not yet here yet. Just hang on. So that's what he tells them. And then, Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So Mary then looks at the servants and just says, hey, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Now, the reason I think Mary told Jesus there is no wine with expectancy is because of verse 5. Because after he says, after Mary says, hey, there's no wine, Jesus, and then Jesus is kind of like, Hey, my time's not yet. Mary says, looks back at the service saying, hey, whatever he tells you, do it. She knows he's going to do something. She knows Jesus is somehow going to take care of this problem, fix it, do something. She knows that. She has gone to Jesus with expectancy. I think that's a good, simple lesson for us as well. Do you go to Jesus with expectancy? Like Mary did. Do you go expecting something's going to happen? He can fix something. He can change something. Jesus is the one who can solve this problem. It may not be the exact way I want it, but he can take care of this. So that's the problem that we see that they've faced. There's no wine at this wedding. And then we move to the provision. Look at verses 6 and 7. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. Now these were stone water jars used for purification. He specifically tells us that. But stop and think about the more, probably what would seem like the more uh, common thing you would do in this situation. You're at a wedding, they had wine, but the wine has run out. So you know what that means? There's, they have their empty wineskins. Now I know, we, Jesus teaches about you can't put new wine into old wineskins because it'll, it'll bust them open. But I mean, we're talking about making wine out of nothing. We're talking about a miracle here with Jesus. He can put wine into a wineskin. You would think he would just simply fill the wineskins that were there. That seems to be the more realistic thing to do. But he doesn't. Instead of refilling the wineskins that ran out, I mean, you stop and think about the boy. We'll get there in a while in John 6 with the fish and the loaves. He just had a little and he just kept on passing it out and it just kept going and going and going. You would think he could take the wineskins and just let them keep drinking and drinking and it'd just always be full. You could have done it that way. But instead, John says, no, he took these stone jars that were used for this purification that they would do in the Old Testament. That's what he decided to use, these empty jars that were there. Now, I think John, the author, is trying to show us something. I think there's a point behind this and why he does this. He seems to want to make a point out of the fact that he didn't just refill these wineskins, but instead use these stone purification pots. It's also interesting that we don't know a whole lot about these stone pots used for 
for purification, but when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, there's lots of writing in there that verify that and, and just reaffirm exactly what John is saying here in, in John chapter 2. But one commentator states that he says the Old Testament shadow has now been replaced by the New Testament substance. That that's what's being communicated by using these old pots. The external purification of the Old Testament is now replaced with the internal cleansing of Christ. It's also interesting how Scripture uses this wine that's put in these pots as a metaphor for joy. A metaphor for joy. You know, I was talking with a church member this week and about bread and wine and how that's used in Scripture. And I just found it interesting that or he, he, he was telling me how fascinating it was because he didn't know that. But, but look at Psalm. You don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screens if you, if you don't want to turn there. But Psalm 104, 14 and 15, the psalmist writes, You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The wine is there to gladden the heart of man, to, to bring joy to man. And then also in Judges, we've got some somewhat poetic writing in Judges 9, verses 12 and 13, where he writes and says, And the tree said to the vine, You come reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my wine that cheers, notice this, God and man and men, and go hold sway over the trees. There you see wine cheering the heart of both God and man. Look, I could, we could go on a, a whole list. There's tons of scripture that, that equate wine with joy. That's what it represents often in scripture. And as we read there in Judges, mankind and God are both cheered and full of joy with wine. A.W. Pink, here's what he wrote. He said, while Judaism was still being practiced, it was cold, dead, and empty, just like these stone purification pots. Now Jesus fills them to the brim with abundant joy. And we seem to have this tendency to downplay the importance of joy in the Christian life often times, it seems like. But, but keep in mind what joy is. Galatians 5.22 you know what the second fruit of the Spirit mentioned? It's joy. It's joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Psalm 32, 11. The psalmist writes, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. He says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. You know what joy is acted out? The verb form of joy is rejoice. When it says rejoice, that is joy being acted out. If you're full of joy, what do you do? You rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord is what he tells them. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy. Romans 14, 17 for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know, I think oftentimes we, we, we just assume that it part and parcel to being a Christian is righteousness. You need to be righteous. We know that. That's kind of a given. And so we focus on that. I need to be righteous. I need to, to be a righteous person with my conduct because that's what it means to be a Christian. And, and we also know we need peace with God. Clearly, I, I want to be on God's side. I don't want him against me. And so we focus on that, I think, pretty easily. But keep in mind what Romans 14, 17 says. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
John 15, look, fast forward in John, just a, a handful of pages. John 15, 11. You all know this verse. John 15, 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Not just have a little joy, but that it may be full to the brim like these water pots. That, that's why he's, he's here. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy will be in you. That's what he wants for us, to have joy. There's an old saying from the rabbis that said, without wine, there is no joy. And similarly, I would say a wedding without wine is kind of symbolic of a life without Christ. There's no true joy there. I mean, just think practically about the Christian life if there's no joy involved. Are, are you drawn to someone who has no joy in their life? No, I don't think so. Me neither. We all know those people where it just seems like everything is negative all the time. One of those comments that I know I've used with Miss Tony, not about Miss Tony, but to Miss Tony, being a music person, is I've referred to those that are more minor chord people not a happy G chord, because those minor chords are the kind of somber, solemn sounding, you know, and I think, man, have some joy. Just have some joy in your life. That's what we're called to be. I can remember a testimony from a, a former church member here that uh, worked at Exxon, and he was telling me, he said, man, I, I had a group of guys that I was always with, and, and uh, for the longest time, I would watch them, and this one guy just stood out to me, and it seemed like he never had a bad day. And he said, I hate to admit it, but it aggravated me. Because I thought, How? You, you always seem like you've got, you, just nothing shakes you. You just have joy. Why, why? And it drove him nuts until finally one day it culminated with him going to this man and saying, what's the deal with you? Why, why don't you get all aggravated and worked up about anything? Why, why are you happy? I don't understand. What, what is different? What, what's your deal? And the guy responded by smiling saying, man, let me share the gospel with you. And you know it led to his salvation. That's how he came to know the Lord. Through the joy of someone else. Charles Spurgeon said, sepulchral tones may fit a man to be an undertaker, but Lazarus is not called out of his grave by hollow moans. Therefore, I commend cheerfulness to all who would win souls. You want to help further the kingdom of God through sharing the gospel with others? Maybe you need some more joy, the joy of Christ in your life as you go share. Verses 8 through 10 in our passage. He says, And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, everyone, who serves the good, everyone serves the good wine first, but when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. You have kept the good wine until now. Now, this master of the feast, in my opinion, kind of lets the cat out the bag, like the secret. You know, that's what you're not supposed to tell people, that you serve the good wine first. And once they've had a bit, then you can give whatever. doesn't matter. It all tastes the same at this point. And they drink whatever. It's, it's similar to what we, uh, <laughs> I couldn't help but think of our youth Christmas party we do at the Sumner's house every year. There are two highly prized items that we typically have at our youth Christmas party. Miss Kelly Saracen's homemade chocolate chip cookies, which are fantastic, and Miss Top's pound cake. Now, here's how this usually happens. Youth, I'm sorry, confession time. I'm technically not the youth pastor anymore. I can do this, I guess. We take those items and put them on the counter over here, and then we get the big great value cookie tray and put it out and say, have at it, Merry Christmas, and us adults will kind of take a slice off of that homemade pound cake and 
And we'll go, eh, we don't hide it. We're not lying about it. We just don't really put it right out there in the open, you know. It's kind of one of those secrets of the trade. You learn what, what you do with those things. But that's what the, this guy says. But Christ doesn't operate that way. Jesus does not operate that way. I started the title of this sermon, The Best for Last, because that's what he does. He says, oh, no, it's just going to get better and better. This wine is not just some cheap wine, but when he turns water into wine, it is amazing. It's the best wine. They said, you saved this incredible wine for after they've already been drinking. Like, the master of the feast is amazed. Not just does he have the power to turn water into wine, but the highest of quality of wine that he turns it into. Now consider the amount also, back from verse 6. Six stone water jars that each one holds 20 to 30 gallons. To do the math quickly, that's 120 to 180 gallons of wine that he has just made. They, they would not need near about that much for this wedding. Nowhere near that much. This is a small wedding in Cana of Galilee, a little nothing town. Why would you possibly, I think the point there is that Christ is more than enough, abundant. You have all you need. Plenty for everyone. But then we go on to the proof of this text in 11 and 12. Look, what he, look how this story kind of wraps up. Verse 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Now, John calls this a sign, a sign. Now, I've got several pet peeves, and one of mine, just scripturally speaking, is our overuse of the word miracle. I know I've hit on this numerous times to the youth. I know I've said it from this pulpit before. Miracles, there's a definition for a miracle. Uh, the most common thing you hear people say when a baby is born, oh, look how beautiful, what a miracle. I hate to be the downer kind of person. That's not a miracle. That's called biology. It happens all the time. You, you can have, you, you, that's how new life comes about. It's not a miracle. It's amazing. It's awe-inspiring. It's fascinating. We love it. It's beautiful. Cherish it. I'm not downplaying it. I've got four kids myself, and it, it's amazing. Each time uh, one of my children were born, it was an amazing experience, but it's not a miracle. You learn about that in middle school biology. It's how new life comes about. A miracle is something that goes against all the laws of nature, against everything. That's a miracle. If this just all of a sudden started floating, you've never seen that happen before, that's a miracle. That, that we have gravity. It doesn't work that way. You, you don't just, this is not just simply something that's awe-inspiring like a birth of a child. This is a miracle. You, you don't just take water. You take an empty jar and the servants filled it and it specifically says to the brim. In other words, it didn't fill it two-thirds of the way to where Jesus just took some some really highly concentrated wine and added it to it to make it wine. No, no. They filled it with just water to the brim and then instantly, when you dip it out, it is the most incredible wine you've ever had. That is a miracle. That's what a miracle is. Not a beautiful sunset. The sun sets every day. It's been happening for all of creation. It's not a miracle. It's beautiful and it's amazing. But that's not a miracle. This water into wine is a miracle. So what's the purpose why do this? Because he tells you there, this is the first of his signs. Well, we know what a sign is, right? A sign points to something. A stop sign is telling you, stop. A street sign is telling you, this is the street that you're on. That's what signs do. They're trying to point to something. And John tells us this, the first of his signs. So Jesus turning water into wine is a sign that's supposed to tell us something. What's he telling us? Well, I think in short, you could say what he's telling us is not only does Jesus have the opportunity or the, the ability to turn water and just transform it like that into wine, but he has the power to take you, a sinner, and transform you into a saint. He has the cleansing power. 
to wash away all of your sins. That's what Jesus has the ability to do. Look, (laughs) I want to wrap this up in a fun, maybe a fun way. Do y'all remember the, the story in the 90s that had children's books about the family of bears? Y'all remember that? What I'm talking about, the family of bears, they had little children's books that you read. Anybody? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the Berenstein Bears. Everybody knows about the Berenstein Bears, except the vast majority of people you talk to, when you ask them, that's what they'll say. Yeah, I remember the Berenstein Bears or the Bernstein Bears, but that's not the name of the bears. They're the Berenstein Bears. There's no I-E. It's an A-I. Berenstain. But we just, we misremember it. We don't think of it in the right way. There's a bunch of them. I could sit here and go through a whole list, but uh, there's, some of the young people would know they've probably heard about uh, this, this thing they call the Mandela effect where a whole groups, large groups of people remember things just totally differently than the way they actually were kind of like the the little fruit of the loom logo most people would swear it's a little cornucopia with the grapes and the apple and the orange and all the fruit coming out but there has never been a cornucopia in their logo ever it's just not there it's just not there you even think of the old snow white movie right with the wicked queen and what does she say mirror mirror on the wall who's the fairest of them all except that's not what she says but everybody will swear, she's, yes, I know that story. She says mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fair? But she doesn't. She says magic mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all. Even some of you Star Wars people, y'all know the old line, Luke, I am your father. It's not what he says. That's only a few words, that's not what he says. He says, no, I am your father. Everybody named Luke has had someone go to them and say, Luke, I am your father, and make that joke about that. But that's not what he says in the movie. We misquote it all the time. He says, no, I am your father. Not Luke, I am your father. Even, hello, Clarice. Not a movie I ever thought I'd quote from here. He never says, hello, Clarice, in Silence of the Lambs. He says, good evening. He says all these other things. He never says, hello, Clarice. Never says it. There's a bunch of these. The Monopoly Man. I tried these out this week with some of the, the Monopoly Man. You know, he's got the big old mustache. Uh, he's actually a rendition of J.P. Morgan from back in the 30s. He didn't leave anything for me. No Ken, I don't believe. But, but the financial wizard. But he had the big mustache. He's got like a hat, a tuxedo, and the monocle and all that. Except he doesn't have a monocle. But everyone would swear he has a monocle. What, what am I getting at? We can oftentimes be misled we think we know things. If you were to poll people, I guarantee 90% of you would have took it to the bank that that Monopoly guy's got a monocle. That's how everybody remembers it. But it's not true. You're just off. And likewise, I think when we think about life and what kind of this is bringing, the world will try and convince you. And so many of us get absolutely fooled and convinced that our joy and fulfillment will come if we could just get that that promotion at work that we so well deserve, if we could just get one more pay raise, then I would have enough money coming in. If I could just fix this one thing in my marriage, all would be well, I'd be happy. If I could just get my house remodeled or get a new pool, then it would relieve all the stress and I'd be great, I'd be fine. If I just had another vehicle, you could go on and on and on. And even though we know that it's wrong, so many of us are absolutely convinced that our ultimate joy and fulfillment will come somehow in these worldly things that are offered to us. But I think what Christ is, what what, what we see in Scripture is that no, all of that will leave you behind. Just like many of us are totally wrong on quoting movies and and things that we think we remember and know, but we're wrong. Just like that, so many of us will try and find that joy and fulfillment in worldly things when only Christ can truly bring that eternal joy that will save us. So here's what I want to leave you with 
with this story of the miracle of turning water into wine at Cana. If you have trusted Christ for salvation, think about the symbolism here with joy and wine. Let joy mark your life as a Christian. Go share that with others. Let the joy of Christ flow through you so that others can come to know him through your life. And if you don't know Christ in a saving way, very clearly, Jesus has the power to take water and instantly turn it into wine. But even more amazing, he has the power to take you a sinner and transform you into a saint, into a believer. And that can happen right now, today. Let's pray. And we'll close.